so first off, I'd like to know how many of you have had a virtual reality experience? Wow! So I've been doing talks on VR for about a year, and each time I give one, the amount of hands that goes up raises so much more. And this is, this is you guys are definitely winning. Now, how many people would consider themselves empathic? Okay, that's always a funny question to get asked, isn't it? It's almost like being asked if you're nice. So you have to say, yes, I, I think I'm nice, and you're hesitant to raise your hand. I'm going to talk today about the relationship between virtual reality and empathy. And uh, don't worry if you didn't raise your hand right away. We're all empathic. This is not something that you're born with or not. Uh, it's not a personality trait. And there is much that VR can do to help bring it out in each of us. A couple of years ago, I was at my annual social impact conference, and I came across a virtual reality demo booth. I was planning to walk by. Even though I'm a social scientist who studies how emerging tech affects behavior, I really wasn't ready for this. I knew that VR was intense. I knew that if it was scary or sad, I was going to leave there in a crying mess and hand back one of these nice, expensive headsets with mascara all cooped up in there. But then I saw this question hanging over the booth. Can VR trigger empathy? Well, now they had me. Empathy is my worldview, and it is also the framework that I use for my research. Again, I didn't ask what the experience was, because uh, that could give me a chance to back out, walk away. So I just sat down. I let them put the headset on. And I was transported to a Syrian refugee camp, listening to Sidra, a 12-year-old girl, talk about what life is like when you suddenly find yourself ripped from your country, your culture, and everything you know. The film is by Within, and I'd like to show you a bit of it. My mother makes sure we are all together for dinner. I still love her food, even if she doesn't have the spices she used to. There were a lot of tears, and I definitely gave it back, all crusted with mascara. This had a profound effect on me. The feeling that I got first, what hit me first, was sameness. We are all the same. I have an 11-year-old daughter, and this could have been her, could have been our life. And I sat on the ground in that tent, and I stood next to the kids while they played soccer, and I had a real experience that I couldn't have otherwise had before. And VR gave that to me. I felt that VR was going to be the most profound technology I'd ever work on. Immersive storytelling is not new, traditionally or technically. There are many giants who've paved the way for us. In Native American culture, they've regarded storytelling and this idea of being a storyteller as a craft, and it's a revered position that you don't get to do unless you're someone who can make your audience believe that they're in it. And technically, we can fast forward from the 1800s to the 1990s gaming industry, where now we've got computer-generated environments, and they're letting us walk around shooting things, but we're in some pretty giant headsets, <laughs> and we're tethered to a lot of machinery. Don't you wish these would come back? Yeah. This is amazing. Everyone should get a chance to wear a TV on their head. <laughs> Clouds over Cedra is not this. It's 360 video. Now, you may know the difference. You may not. Uh, this is an experienced VR crowd. You might not have been thinking of Clouds Over Cedra as VR when you first saw the film. When you are in a headset and you're watching 360 video, you can see all around you. You're seeing what's in the actual environment. So you're right that it is not virtual in terms of its real footage, its real people, but it's immersive in ways that humans have not been exposed to before. Now, VR can do that today because we have a vastly improved sense of presence in the technology. Presence is the mind-body trick that happens where our brains count a virtual experience as if it was a real one or a lived one. And you all know what this feels like at this point. We have these nice, um, small, even though some people think these are huge, they're getting smaller by the moment. So these are cheaper, they're more accessible. And really, at this point, all you need is about 100 bucks and a smartphone. And you can have a pretty good experience in VR. The answer is definitely yes to that original question that I came across. VR does trigger empathy. And what else could it be doing to us as social beings? Do you think it could change your actions or your behavior? 
These are some of the things I'm interested in as a researcher. So you may have heard that the world is in a bit of a political crisis lately. Anyone? <laughs> Whether you believe we're becoming more divided as a global culture, or you could think that we're becoming more empowered. That's on the table, too. But we can all agree that what we show in the media today has reached this crazy level of sensationalism. It's certainly happening here in the UK, and it's happening in America. Here we are in the US. Just have to have a look across the top, and you get the point. President, Mexicans, women, bad, sexist. This used to be really funny when these things came out. We, you know, all of my friends and, and colleagues would laugh about all these tweets. It's not as funny now that they're coming true, and some of the things he says are, are coming to fruition. But the point being that this is how Google buckets the now famous quotes and tweets from our president. So now if you can imagine experiencing some of today's news in VR, where we feel presence, and it gets really interesting. Immersive journalism is a thing now. News giants like the New York Times starting to present some of their things in 360. If you can imagine for a moment being dropped into the middle of the scene, because that's the effect that 360 has, and your brain is living the assassination of the Russian ambassador, or of Joe Cox as she's stabbed in the street. Or you could be rushing out on the field with your team when they win the World Cup. Or you could be here on a beach in Turkey next to this three-year-old boy who didn't quite make it. So this is viral coverage of our global refugee crisis. This is normal news today. We see these kind of things all the time. What can we do with all of this emotional response? Because VR is raising our heart rates when we're in it, and it's engaging us in, in these ways that we haven't been fully engaged before. And I thought, how can we use this for social good? Let me give you an example that might not seem likely at the beginning, but you'll get it by the end, from the presidential election, which is now considered our most controversial in history in America. On the night, I followed Twitter, CNN, and Facebook. And on Twitter, what I was finding was an incredible amount of bashing, hate speech, people just trying to get the last word. Facebook sent me into a near panic because I was listening to states being called for Trump or Clinton, and the text feeds and the emojis that were going by were so offensive. It was angry face, angry face, angry face, floating by with words to match. And I felt this unleashing of people that I can only describe as the opposite of empathy. Now let me show you what was going on in VR at the same time. This is alt space VR. <laughs> Decision night in America continues. Today conceded the presidential election to President Truman under a New York dateline. So this is a virtual reality platform, so you are in a headset that's on the web. So it's kind of like your spot on the web. You can go there to create an event, attend an event like this one. They also had the debates going on here. Things you can do in the space, you can message each other, you can talk in real time audio. You can do virtual high fives and fist pumps, handshakes, hugs, and you can show how you're feeling with emojis. So Alt Space VR teamed up with NBC News, and there you see another news giant getting into VR, to create this virtual democracy plaza. That's what you see here. And you might even recognize it if you've been to New York City. This is Rockefeller Center. It's a pretty amazing computer generation <laughs> version here. It looks exactly like that. Unlike, in very sharp contrast to what was going on in this harsh Twitter party, this was different. There are thousands of people from over 150 countries here coming together to view this election as a group. It was like a global election party in your living room, but it's virtual, it's amazing. So it's not that people were holding back opinions here and not sharing, they were certainly passionate about it. And you can check in to see how this felt. Uh, if, you, if you actually listened to the questions and listened to his answers, that he pretty much dodged every single question that the moderator proposed, and then all he went to and, and did is try and attack her again. I wanted to give you a sense of how it felt to be in this space. There's obviously someone sharing an opinion there, and people gathered around to hear what he has to say. There, there are some emojis going up. Agreement, I assume, hearts and hand clapping. This um, avatar in the front is raising a hand, so they would like to speak next feels more alive, right? You can have nonverbal expressions here as well. I, I don't know what that is. 
I think it's excitement. I'm not sure. <laughs> there's not a tone of aggression here. There's a tone of respect and there's a willingness to listen to people who you know are going to have differing opinions from you. So why? Why was this happening? What was so different about VR that night than these other social media covering the same event, the same exact time? Well, it goes back to presence, this idea of being there. It doesn't matter what you've chosen to be or who you've chosen to be in this environment. You can be an androgynous curly Q avatar like you see here. In fact, we don't know the gender of most of these until they speak, if they do speak. You can be a robot or you can be a humanoid with regular clothes and a face and maybe a little bit more identity <coughs> to yourself. But the cool thing is that none of that matters. What matters is that you're there and you have chosen this environment because you find it enriching to be in an exchange. You're interacting. In VR, the environment itself sets us up for empathy. And because we're in an interaction, we don't say inflammatory things that we would never say to someone's face. I realize I'm in their virtual face. This is real. Lots of other VR experiences that you can have that will take you far beyond this in terms of empathy and perspective taking, like walking in someone else's shoes. You can swap out your body. You can spend time as another race, gender. You can be um, homeless, hungry, disabled, 80 years old. We haven't had that kind of experience available to us before. And I think it's a great force toward togetherness. So my mind often comes back to Cedra. In fact, I've been carting my headset around, showing the experience to people and recording their reactions. Hmm. That was pretty cool. Yeah? Yes. So just overall thoughts or ask any specific questions? Um, there's a lot to take in. So as far as the so what, did it do anything? Can we say that this film had any reaction? Did it change uh, somebody's action or behavior? I don't know yet, but one 13-year-old boy gave me a glimpse into what I might find. He got back in touch with me to say that a refugee family came to his school around Christmas time, and the point was for the students to meet face to face this family that they were sponsoring for clothing and food and such. And he said he kept thinking about the school at the camp where Cedra was and how she'd been there almost two years. And he wondered, would this boy ever see his country again? So he asked to play soccer with him. They did that. Weather turned cold. They still got together. They're kind of close in age, these boys. And now they do homework, just hang out, play games, and offer friendship. This was over a year after he'd seen the film. To me, that's a direct shot. That's empathy to action. So ultimately, the choice is ours. You hold the key. We hold the key to VR's power. This can be an amazing vehicle to help us deepen our understanding of each other. And technology can help us be more human. It can do that. So it's up to us to use it for the social good. Thank you. <laughs>